You wrote the application, correct? I did, yes. Some of the words you used were awful argument, sad, seemingly insignificant, frozen, paralyzed, it's like I can't breathe. I'm actually shocked he's been able to kind of juggle the money as he has been able to. But um, recently, Brian has talked about retiring early um, within the next year and a half. That has completely paralyzed me. And the fight was awful. Since I don't know anything about his income, I don't know if we're prepared. And I am the saver, I am the planner. I don't want to lose this life that I have. I love it. We love it, and I don't want it to go away. Meet Brian and Rachel. Brian's 56, Rachel is 51. They're both lawyers. This is Brian's second marriage, and he has two 22-year-old daughters. Now, Brian recently mentioned that he wants to retire in the next two years, which caused Rachel to start panicking about their finances. In today's conversation, I want you to listen closely for ways to apply these lessons to your own finances. I think you're going to hear how our money psychology shrinks our view to only consider one or two options. But I also think that you're going to hear how you can expand your vision of what's possible. And if you can do that, you'll often find creative ways to live a rich life. If you've been enjoying this podcast where I speak to couples and share their real numbers, their income, their net worth, their debt, all of it, then do me a favor, go over to Apple Podcasts and please leave a written review. It really helps us grow the podcast and it's also something that I can share with my team who helps produce this amazing show every single week. So do me a favor, go over to Apple Podcasts, leave a written review and it will be a big favor for me and for my entire team. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. I have to tell you that I really enjoyed this conversation. So listen in as we meet Rachel and Brian. The one thing that got us into this huge argument was about money. And it was crazy. It was like we were, it was like we were from two different universes and we weren't even speaking the same language. It and there was just all kinds of misunderstandings on both sides, and it was really bad. It was really horrible. I have been trying to talk to him about money recently because he seems to have been dropping kind of some hints that he might be have some having some issues um paying some of the bills. It wasn't something that I could specifically put my finger on, but I felt like I really needed to talk to him about it. And he kept actually asking, why do you why do you keep bringing this up? Why do you keep asking? What was your intention when you walked into that office? What were you really trying to get? I was trying to help, honestly. I feel like I have a bigger cushion than he might have. And I wanted to see if there was a way that we could, I could help him out so that he didn't feel pinched. Did you say that to him? No. He went on his computer and he he wrote this post-it note and he said, there, uh, there you go. Here is the amount of money that I have left over at the end of the month. And I said, well, that would feel horrible. Like, I don't want you to feel that way. So what if I just contribute? You know, like the bills have gone up, the, the ones that you're responsible for. And we haven't um, changed our agreement since it since the beginning. He and I have always kept um, all of our finances completely separate. So his income goes into his accounts. He pays certain bills out of those. Whatever is left over, he has the ability to um, go ahead and do whatever he wants with that. Same thing with my on my side. Okay. All right. All right. Brian, I'd like to ask you your perspective on that meeting. Do you remember being in your office when that happened? I do. Yes. Walk me through your recollection. It was actually ironic that I was paying bills at the time. I had come to the conclusion that that particular month was was going to be tough. Um, I I've never not paid the bills, um, so I don't recall that part of the conversation where I would have said, 
I can't pay the bills. I believed her, but I also think I, I was at that sort of standpoint where I was frustrated and probably feeling, um, it's probably my old Italian pride. Like, you know, I'm, I'm traditionally, you know, the babe, the uh, bill payer. I probably reacted in a way that I don't, I, I don't normally react. And I, I felt badly about it. It wasn't some knockdown drag out thing, but we, we were definitely raising our voices at each other. I do remember him saying that it was probably his pride that got in the okay. way. How, how did you receive that when he said that to you? It's pretty unusual, honestly, to hear somebody say that. It felt amazing. And, and I felt badly that I had approached him in a way that even caused this. I was just trying to help. I'd like to just understand a little bit more about the relationship. So I understand this is both your second marriage. Is that right? No, just Brian's second marriage. Brian's second marriage, Rachel, your first marriage. Correct. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. Glad I clarified. Right. And how long have you been married for? Uh, eight years. Okay, great. You kept your money separate. Was that a conscious decision or was it we kind of just slid into it because we never joined our accounts? I think it was a, a bit of both, to be honest with you. Our expenses have gotten a little more uh, uh, higher as, we, as, as the marriage has gone on. Um, I, I, we talked about it when we were first getting together. Uh, we each had a comfort level with keeping our, our accounts separate. But with the understanding, I think that, you know, based on our income levels, we were going to be able to pay for, I was going to be able to pay for the utilities. We have a second property that, that she is primarily responsible for, that she pays the bills for. So I, my, my understanding is we kind of went into it with the plan to kind of keep things separately unless something happened and we couldn't anymore. I just had a curiosity. Why did you decide to keep it separate? Not that it's right or wrong. It's just a little unusual. From my perspective, I think it was just something we were both used to. Rachel has has always just been meticulous uh, with her finances. I, even in my first marriage, was respond. I, I I was the only uh, person with an income. My my ex wife uh, wasn't working, so I kind of got into that habit of paying for everything, and um, I felt like I didn't want to put pressure on Rachel. And I didn't think that I needed to. Makes sense. That that's typically what happens. So when when you got together, you kind of talked about it a little bit. You both decided, hey, we're in our late forties. We've been doing this our individual ways for a while. Let's just kind of keep that going. Let's make an agreement on I pay for this, you pay for that. That's how it's gone for the last eight years. Actually, from my side, I would say that is not why I went into it. Oh, tell me. <laughs> To be perfectly honest, Brian had had some trouble with money in his marriage, and I had heard about that. And I, as he said, have always saved. I did not want to be in a position where there were money issues. I also came into the marriage with property. And honestly, I wanted to make sure that nothing happened with that property, that we didn't lose it, that I was the one that was taking care of it. I was the one paying bills on it. And I was the one who was responsible for all of the bills on it. Okay. That's a different story. <laughs> well, um, which one is it? I'm, I, I, wow. I'm really kind of su surprised. Um, <laughs> I, the, the, the money problems that I think Rachel's referring to, um, my ex-wife had put a lot of money on a credit card and through and she was somewhat irresponsible with money and so part of my divorce settlement was actually paying that lump a lump sum to her to kind of uh and and pay off her her debt mm -hmm. so that i i felt i was coming into the marriage pretty free and clear so I didn't mean to act all surprised when Rachel said that, but I, 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 I am actually very surprised. That was quite revealing. It's actually very common that couples learn something new about each other on this podcast. And the reason is that most of us stop having deep conversations after we date for a while. This is especially true around sensitive topics like how we feel and money and frankly, anything else that we walk on eggshells around. 
The first clue I noticed was that their money is separate. That's not necessarily bad, although most successful couples tend to have their finances joined together. What separate accounts usually reveal is that the couple never had a series of specific conversations about money. And almost always, separate accounts reveal that they don't have a joint rich life vision together. You can also tell that their financial system is clunky, with one person randomly paying certain expenses, then they have to decide on vacations every single time. The third clue is that Brian and Rachel realize they have totally different perspectives on why they keep their money separate. However, the next clue was that this is Brian's second marriage. Now, it's very common that second marriages have separate finances, often because money was an unhappy issue in their first marriage. I do want to add that I appreciate their communication style, especially him admitting his pride was getting in the way. We'll be right back. It's funny how when it comes to one of our hobbies, you can actually involve a ton of rich life techniques around it. When it comes to my coffee, I have a spreadsheet of different beans that I want to try and I order from them regularly. I also would wake up in the morning and have this dirty French press that I had to scrub. I decided I'm going to spend $29, get a second French press. Now I always have a clean French press ready to go. Now, if you love morning coffee, let me give you a quick suggestion. It's one of our sponsors today, Trade Coffee, a subscription service that makes it so simple to discover new coffees and make great coffee at home. Trade partners with top-rated independent roasters so you can get the best quality coffee sent right to your home. Now, maybe you already know what you like, or maybe you are new to specialty coffee and you need some help. Either way, Trade makes it easy to discover new coffees. They'll send them fresh to your home on your preferred schedule. So upgrade your morning routine with better coffee. Right now, Trade is offering our audience a free bag of coffee with any subscription at drinktrade.com slash Ramit. That's drinktrade, T-R-A-D-E dot com slash Ramit, R-A-M-I-T, for a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. drinktrade.com slash Ramit. I have a program called Earnable where I teach people how to find an idea, start a business, and then grow it. Now, one of the things I've learned is that the technical part can be really tricky. It used to be challenging. You'd have to set up a WordPress site, pick plugins, hire a designer, then a developer, all kinds of confusing stuff. But the truth is, things have changed in the last decade. If you've ever wanted to create a business off of your unique expertise, then I want you to check out today's sponsor, Thinkific. And I'm happy to recommend them because I actually use them myself for our digital programs. Thinkific is a leading platform for creating, marketing, and selling online learning programs. You can use it to easily build courses, communities, and memberships to make an impact for your customers. And they have all the features you would expect, plus quizzes and custom domains. So my suggestion, if you have created an online program, you're looking for a website, a way to serve your customers, check out thinkific.com to learn more. That's thinkific, T-H-I-N-K-I-F-I-C.com. Now back to the show. How often do you talk about money in your relationship today? Often in terms of <laughs> uh, trips, in terms of, uh, well, now more recently bills. Um, but like how often? Uh, daily, weekly, monthly? What are we talking about? Uh, I would guess weekly. Probably Rachel more than, okay. more than I. Rachel, you agree? Weekly, I, you bring it up? Yes, but more in a way like the grocery wouldn't accept my coupon or something like that. <laughs> Hold on, hold on. I just need to. I just need to look at your income really quick. Mm. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to confirm that. Mm. Okay, I deserve that. How much time do you spend cutting coupons every week? Tell the truth. Actually, Brian's the one that cuts coupons. There's the irony, right? I do. I do. <laughs> what coupons are you the most proud of? You get the two for one, three for one. What do you get? It's the twenty dollars off for the purchase over a certain amount, <laughs> which is ironic because you still have to pay that certain amount to get the $20 off. So I think I fool myself sometimes. I know. I grew up. My mom was a master coupon cutter and just had a file. Just boom. every She knew every date, expiration date, all of it. Yeah, I get it. Rachel, when you think about money, what words come to mind for you? Um, fun. Freedom and saving. 
You wrote the application, correct? I did, yes. Okay. So some of the words you used were awful argument, sad, seemingly insignificant, frozen, paralyzed, it's like I can't breathe. Yes. Do you remember writing that? I do, absolutely. And all of those fit. Up until now, money has been representative of fun and freedom. But um, recently, Brian has talked about retiring early um, within the next year and a half. Mm -hmm. And that has completely paralyzed me. And the fight was awful. (laughs) So overnight, you started feeling differently about money after he brought up potentially retiring. Yes, because we would be living only on my income. Okay. Um, for a while. And I, since I don't know anything about his income, I don't know if we're prepared. And I am the saver. I am the planner. So you keep your finances separate being married eight years, but you don't. You each don't know about each other's income, expenses, anything. Not at all. But then this bombshell comes out. Brian goes, hey, I'm thinking about retiring right around the corner. And what what did your mind start telling you? Holy <laughs> what do we do? I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know anything about what he had saved. I didn't know anything about what the bills were that he was paying. He's always talked about retiring, but it became serious um, about a year ago where he really decided that this is really what he wants to do. Okay. And Brian has always been very cavalier about this. So every time I've tried to talk to him about it since, he's been like, oh, we're fine. Everything's fine. Ah. Are you fine, Brian? I believe so. <laughs> Our plan is before I retire, the house is completely paid off, okay. um, which is probably our greatest expense. I would have a retirement account to to draw from so we wouldn't just be on Rachel's income. Um, so that's kind of one of the things that I, I didn't really understand about that part of the conversation is, is why she was under the impression that we would have to be living on her income. I would have to take a little bit of umbrage with the word cavalier. I, I certainly, I, I, I don't want to discount what she's feeling and I certainly didn't mean to give you that impression, but I'm fairly confident Rachel, I'm curious, Brian's reaction saying, not only do I think we will be okay, but I think we're going to be quite easily okay, more than okay. How does that make you feel? I wish it would make me feel secure, but honestly, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish I would feel comfortable. Uh What would make you feel secure? Honestly, I don't know. I really don't. I think the amount of money that he's talking about that he would get in retirement is significantly less than what he thinks it is. So I don't know. There isn't a number that I could put my finger on. Honestly, I don't I don't know. Brian and I have an amazing relationship. We travel the world together. We have tons of fun and we have a lot of respect for each other um, for how hard we work and I love the way that he provides but my fear is if his income is gone that we won't be able to live on the money that he's bringing for retirement also I I don't want to lose this life that I have I I love it we love it and I don't want it to go away. It's striking how many Americans follow the exact same script with their money, but they don't realize it. Here, we understand that they want to pay off their mortgage early, a big clue, and that she's afraid of having enough while he tries to reassure her. I would say that probably 90% of Americans think exactly this way. And yet, if we examine these concepts a little more deeply, everything falls apart. For example, you heard me ask Rachel, what would make you feel secure? And she just simply said, I don't know. I almost, um, 
I almost had a, I almost lost a house. I almost had a house be repossessed because I lost my job and I had to actually move to take a job in a different city and get an apartment there in order to pay for the mortgage payments on that house. While the guy that I was dating at the time and living with lived in that house, rent-free, expense-free. And I know that that creates a lot of my fear. Do you want to send him a message worldwide (laughs) right now? You want to say anything to him? Go ahead. The airwaves are yours. You can say anything you want. No. It's all good. It's all all been forgiven. It worked out well. (laughs) <laughs> That's enlightened of you. And Brian's my guy, so. Okay, I Aww. love it. Beautiful. That, that is interesting, though. Can you just take me back to what money messages you received growing up from your parents? You saved and saved and saved. Did you grow up in the Midwest? Yes. Okay, keep going. Yeah. Um, you worked as hard as you could in order to bring in money. You saved it for some indeterminate period. Like you didn't even say, I'm going to save until retirement and then I'm going to spend it or enjoy it. It was just, I'm going to save it forever and just keep piling it up um, that you didn't go into debt unless it was good debt and good debt was buying a house. But mostly it was just, you worked and worked and worked and worked and worked in order to maximize your income in order to bring in as much money as you could. Okay, and what did they do for a living? One was a teacher, one was a librarian. They're semi-retired. Okay. Is it for the money or because they enjoy it? I think it's for the money. They um, worked to save up money until retirement and then they retired. They took a short period of time off, maybe a year, and then they were back to trying to make money again. I don't know. What's their financial situation now? I think they're really well off from what I understand, but they just want to continue to bring in money. Okay. So they taught you these thrifty, frugal lessons early on. What about going to college? How did you pay for that? Uh, They did pay for that and they helped me out with the bills. Grad school? Um, same thing. They paid for that and they helped me out with the bills. Whoa. All right. And then as you got into your twenties, what happened? Was there ever a day where they stopped paying? Yeah. Are they still paying? No. Oh God. No. (laughs) Yeah. They stopped paying. (laughs) Okay. So you graduated from uh, grad school and then it was kind of like, okay, you're on your own. Actually, no. Hmm. They came to me, um, my last year in grad school and said that they <laughs> needed me to buy a house because they needed to take money off their uh, taxes and they needed a write-off. What the hell? All right. right. I said I didn't think it was a good idea. I hadn't graduated. I didn't have a job. And I didn't know where my income was going to be once I graduated. Did you end up buying the house? I did because they told me that either way, um, they were going to stop paying for my rent. At the time. So you get the house, and then what happened after that? So I graduated. I got my first um, job, and I was working at it for about a year. And then I was running out of work, and they told me that they couldn't afford to pay me anymore. So they gave me two weeks' notice. I got every job that I could possibly find right away um, in order to pay for the mortgage and the expenses on it. But um, it was draining my savings account. Mm. So I actually asked my boyfriend who was living with me at the time if he could help me out, if he could loan me money. Mm. And then did he? He said no. He said uh, he was sorry, but I needed to figure it out on my own. What do you think about that looking back now? It sucked. Oh my gosh. (laughs) They actually had me take out a school loan. They oh, put the good. down payment on it and then they had me take out a school loan in order to pay for it. This is what we call um, you know, being given a gift with strings attached. Like Huge. 30 years of strings. It just Absolutely. keeps coming. 
it wasn't till later till it kind of hit me that my savings were being drained and um, I was getting really close to my bank account being at zero. And how did you feel then? I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. And then when your boyfriend said no, how did you feel then? Terrified, desperate, Mm -hmm. confused, angry. Mm -hmm. Angry at? Him. Angry at him. Yeah. Um, Did you ever call your parents and ask them to help? I did. What happened? They said they would not. Why? Um... (laughs) Um, because I had just come back from my first trip overseas and they told me that I should not have taken a vacation. I shouldn't have taken a trip and I should have known better and had listened to them. Wow. That's difficult to hear. It was very difficult. How old were you at the time? Um, probably would have been around... 26 or so. It's like, what, what am I supposed to do as a 26-year-old? Like sit in this house that I didn't even really want. That's it for the next 35, 50 years. Just sit. Right. I actually asked them that. Like, what are you supposed to do? And they said, wait till retirement. Let's review the financial lessons that Rachel learned from her Midwestern family. First, frugal parents told her to save, 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 then work, 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 and then die. Second, they paid for a lot of her early life, including school. Third, then they told her she needed to buy a house for a tax write-off, which worked until she got laid off. And then suddenly they told her they couldn't help her because she'd taken a vacation and instead she should have sat on her porch and waited until retirement. What a beautiful circle of life. I'll call it the American buy then die cycle. (sighs) Hold that thought. We'll be right back after this. Let's get back to Brian and Rachel. She has another very formative money experience that she shares with me right now. A little birdie told me that you used to have a financial advisor. Is that true? Oh. Is that true? Oh, God. Yes. Huh? Yes. What? Why the oh, God? I thought financial advisors are always great. After all, the Vanguard behavioral study told me that they add 1% to 3% returns. That's why every AUM financial advisor tells you that you need a financial advisor. Are you telling me that's wrong? I am telling you that is completely wrong. What happened, Rachel? I got a phone call after I lost that first job. I got a phone call about a year later from a um, financial advisor. And he said that um, my former employer had hired him to handle the retirement accounts through that office. So he made arrangements for us to meet. I know he paid for the coffee. That's so nice. What a nice guy. And then what happens at that meeting? (laughs) He talks to me about what my plans are. And I say that I want to uh, save money for retirement. So he starts to talk to me about a Roth IRA. He actually didn't mention anything about safety. He just said, I know that your goals are growth. And you need to have a financial advisor that watches your accounts because if you are invested in an account with um, another um, like Vanguard type place yeah. and the fund starts to lose money, you want somebody watching over it so that you can get out of it right away. Like a hawk. The yes. minute the market goes down, my local Midwest bank works faster than any number of milliseconds that uh, the the high frequency traders in New York work at. Fine. I, I have to say, I am surprised he did not mention safety. They love to mention safety, especially with women. They f- love it. It drives me insane. Okay, go on. So he says growth. You go. Sounds good to me. I actually asked him how much um, he was charging. Like I was like, what are the fees? Like, What, what am I paying for this? Tell me. He told me not to worry about ah, it. Mother <laughs> this guy. <laughs> it, it's so dismissive. Well, you know, the fees are the fees. You know, it's nominal. But what we're really focused on is long term. We want to make you money over the long term, right? Yes. And he said he wasn't really making money from it. He said, (laughs) um, since I wasn't writing him a check, he's like, I mean, you're really not paying for me. 
I mean, really? That's a lie. That is a <laughs> right. straight up lie. Like 100% yes. a lie, as you later discovered, I assume. I called him on it and I said, there's no way you're doing this for free. So just tell me like what this is. And um, he's like, well, it really varies. Um, I can't really tell you. And I was like, well, okay, give me a range. And he's like, well... Um, with most people, it's about 1%. Some pay 1.25 and then others pay about one and a half. But he's like, it's really not that much money. And if you think about it, you really want somebody to be looking over these accounts. Exactly. He's coin operated. He's, he's very smart. He's, he's like those, you know, those things you used to take your kids to in front of Kmart. Like you put a quarter in and you ride the merry-go-round. Yeah. That's he's coin operated. You, yes. you transfer over an IRA and he just harvests those AUM fees. All right. So he's charging you like, let's say 1%, but that's just the fee. Then there's all the back end uh, fees that he's secretly charging, right? What kind of funds did he yes. put you in? I was invested in what he called A funds, I believe he called it. And those are front loaded funds. And I <laughs> asked him what that means. And he said, all of the money comes off the front um, when you get it, when you invest in them. And I was like, oh, I don't want that. And he said, no, that's really what you do want because your goal is the long-term and your goal is retirement and the long-term returns. So you really want that money coming off the top and um, then it's gone and you don't need to worry about it anymore. And then all you need to focus on are the returns. Let me translate. I'm going to add a large, fat, larded up fee on top of this fund. And I'm just going to put it right at the front. So. It's essentially like you buy this fund and this fat fee just goes to the advisor and it takes years for you to basically work that fee off. And then once that fee's worked off and you've been paying fees the whole time, now you can actually start to get the full benefit of that mutual fund, which actually usually turns out to be not a good fund anyway. Yes. Um, so we meet once a year. I, I actually, sadly enough, invested with that guy for um, over 12 years. Wow. How much total did you invest? Um, $5,000 a year times 12 years. So $60,000 $60, maxing out the Roth All right. for 12 years. And what happened by the end of 12 years? Or are you still with this guy? No, I, I totally got rid of him. I started to kind of get suspicious towards the end because he wouldn't really give me an answer. And I was reading about investing and I kept saying like, I don't, really want to pay fees. I don't want to pay loads. He kept saying, don't worry about it um, because you're making money, which was true. Actually, the statements that I got, um, I didn't really look at how much money I was making, um, but all of the funds that I was invested in and with each statement had a positive return in the list. What happened eventually to make you decide, I'm done with this? I started reading more about investing and said, I think I want to actually do this myself. And he said, um, well, you're going to lose all your money. And I said, what do you mean? Like, I've been investing with you for a while. So what does that mean? And he said, oh, well, you're invested in um, B funds. And I'm like, what's that? And he said, they're backloaded funds. And I asked him what that meant. And he said... You have to be in these. Uh, you have to be invested for a certain period of time to not have to pay fees when you sell when you get out of the fund. And I was like, "Well, how long are the ones that I'm invested in?" And he was like, "Well, I'm not really sure, but I think most of them are the ten year ones." And that's because you said you wanted to stay with us for the long term. I mean, you said you wanted to. <laughs> yes. So I actually did stay with him for a couple more years, but I started actually paying attention to the statements that I'd gotten from the bank. Yeah, good. Because I thought, honestly, that if I started to pay attention to the statements, I could figure out how long I needed to be with them mm -hmm. until I could actually sell. And <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was so eye-opening. I had kept every single statement that I'd gotten, every quarterly statement that I'd gotten for the entire period. I started looking at the returns. <laughs> they were like nothing, nothing, nothing. It was like, 
$10.47. Everyone actually had a plus on every single statement. So each one was making money. But when you actually figured out what that percentage was, it was unbelievably low. And then some of them were like a dollar and seven cents or something yeah. like that. And I was like, oh my God, what is happening to my money? Because that's the one thing that he would always emphasize every time I met with them each year. He'd be like, well, you're looking at your statements. I'm sure you're seeing you're making money. And I was, I would always look down the statements. I would see the positive, you know, the plus sign. And I wouldn't really pay attention or do the math on how much I was making. So I was making nothing. And then I started realizing how often they were turning over my money. And it was unbelievable. Seven funds that I would be invested in, you know, each quarter, at least five to seven of them, every statement would be like turned over. I was um, tracking it and it would be like, oh, this fund is gone and now it's this new fund. And this fund is gone and now it's this new fund. And this you know, fund is you gone know what and they're now doing it's this with new that? fund. And then they were adding, you know, like two new funds every statement. I have to assume it's fees. Fees are part of it. So sometimes okay. they do it um, because they get trading fees. That's absolutely true. And then sometimes because they're all part of the same fund family at a bank, a lot of these funds are complete dog. So after a while, they shut down the underperforming funds. And through a process called survivorship bias, they only leave the quote, good funds and then they introduce new ones. So <laughs> to the investor, when they go to the website 10 years later, all they see are five-star funds. Oh, these funds are all amazing. Well, all the dog ones got taken out and back with a bullet put in their head. You never know that. They're not required to tell you that. It's a very, very subtle trick that the average investor would not know about, uh, except you got smart. So you got out. What'd you do with the money now? Um, I decided to move it into a Vanguard fund. He right. talked to me out of it for a couple of years, but finally, um, I just realized there's no way to get to the 10 years because you're constantly taking my money in and moving it around and mm -hmm. taking it out. So there's no way to avoid those fees. Um, the sad thing was that I, oh God, I maxed out a Roth at $5,000 a year for 12 years at six. So I had a $60,000 in there. When I went to contact um, Vanguard to roll my money over, I asked them what the balance was on the account and um, found out that <laughs> my $60,000 contribution had decreased to like 56,000 and some dollars. Wow. I lost my part of my contract. I not only lost any money that I would have gained in that account, I actually lost part of my full contribution. And so I contacted Vanguard and I, in order to not just <laughs> feel so defeated, I, um, deposited the difference in the money into the Vanguard account in order to at least have my beginning balance be $60,000 because I just felt awful. I didn't have that money to waste. And that's 12 years, more than 12 years gone. But I do have to say, I have had that money in a Vanguard account for um, about 10 years now. And that's, I've never put another dime into it. And that $60,000 is now over $230,000. Wow. I've never done anything to it, right? The advisor told her, if you put money in a Vanguard fund and you lose it, nobody's watching over it. Yeah, okay. When I warm up my chicken for 60 seconds, you think I pull it out at 48 seconds? I go, uh, magnifying glass, is there still salmonella in there? Uh, can I put a thermometer in there? No, I let the chicken cook. It's exactly what you're supposed to do with your investments. By the way, did you catch the other thing? After 12 years of investing and paying $60,000 in fees, she actually had less money than when she started. This is one reason why I discourage you from paying a percentage-based fee to any kind of advisor. You wanna pay a flat fee? Love it. Hourly fee? Great. Do not pay a percentage-based fee though. If you want someone to help you with your investments, you can check out one of our sponsors, Facet, where you can get your own CFP for a flat fee. Check them out, including the special deal they have for IWT listeners at facet.com slash Ramit. 
it made me mad too because he I, I don't I always thought that I would be able to sort of recognize somebody that um didn't have my best interests in mind. Yeah, you caught it 12 years late. And I really wish that you had not had to go through that. But you got smart and I appreciate that. And you're seeing the results in your portfolio. So Yes. Yes. Glad you got out. All right. Yeah. Round yes. of applause. Exactly. All right. Um, <laughs> how do you feel about that entire experience, Rachel? When you look back on it, what words come to mind for you? Angry, confused, taken advantage of. If I can, I'd like to add one more word for you to maybe add to your repertoire as you look back, which would be proud. Thank you. I appreciate that. Actually, after I lost all that money, I didn't look at my accounts until like a couple of weeks ago to prepare for oh, this wow. show. What was that like? <laughs> it was shocking. Like the balance is much, much higher than I ever You like expected. that Vanguard money, huh? I do. <laughs> I am very, very happy with that. Honestly, amazing. I don't mind someone making a mistake with their money. Not even one that lasts for years. What I absolutely love is that Rachel got wise and she took control of her money. She analyzed those statements and she had the courage to call her advisor on his BS and move away to a low-cost brokerage. And all those tricks you heard, A funds, B funds, survivorship bias, are just scratching the surface of the weapons that Wall Street uses to siphon money away from individual investors like you and me. That's why I'm so focused on you understanding how money works. I don't need you to understand every technicality of investing, but I believe that the majority of your money should end up in your pocket, not some AUM advisor who's really a salesperson disguised as an advisor and is instead using your A fund money or your financial fees to pay for his BMW. No, you can get my book from Amazon, Target, any independent bookstore or the library to take control of your own investing. And if you need help, join my money coaching program. My parents, uh, we were probably upper middle class is what I would say. They, I went to private schools for grade school, high school. Those were paid for by my parents. College was paid for by my parents. Grad school was paid for uh, by my parents. They gave me my first uh, down payment uh, on the house. How much did they give you? Uh, it was 10 uh, It was about $15,000. What year are we talking about? That would have been 1996, I believe. Okay. okay. Um, uh, my dad is very much like her parents' hard work ethic. You know, you 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 work hard, you move up, you earn more, you save, you invest. Um, so more recently, I've sort of, especially in, in my relationship with Rachel, um, she's really sort of filled me with vigor for for that type of uh, attitude again towards it. But growing up, uh, I think I was a little bit more sheltered with money. I probably didn't have the appreciation for it. Would you say you were spoiled? Boy, um, it, it, I, in all honesty, yes. I hate to use a negative word, but I think it's a fair word. Um, I would say I was spoiled. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then you have two children. How old did you say they are? They're 22. They're twins. Okay. Did they go to college? They did. Um, uh, ironically, my my uh, father, um, who is still with us, uh, paid for their college. I paid some of it. He paid the majority of it. Did you tell him, hey, I'm going to need some help from you? Or did you ask him? How did that happen? No, he is that dad slash grandpa that just... He was a CEO of a bank for a long, long time. Uh, did well. He retired early, uh, which may maybe I want to follow in those footsteps in a way. And he had planned all along since their birth that he he told me from day one. Got it. To allow him to do that. That's cool. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. All right. Yeah. So um, they're twenty two. Are they done with school now? Well, they are. One is considering going back to school, uh -huh. um, and she's probably going to have to decide here in the next few months. The other one graduated, um, is working a um, part-time job and uh, still trying to figure some things out, I think, with right. career and whatnot. Well, congratulations to 22-year-olds who are 
at least for now, done with school. That's a big mm-hmm. accomplishment as a parent. Yeah. So congrats to you. Thank you. What is the financial relationship between you and your daughters now? Uh, so uh, one of them currently, the one that's thinking about going gr- to grad school is fairly self-sustaining right now, uh, is making enough money. She has two part-time jobs, but she lives in a house with, uh, well, depending on the month, four four to six other girls and makes enough to you know pay her share of the bills and still live fairly comfortably. Uh, the other one is is the one that I'm helping out a little bit more. Um, I'm still paying about three quarters of her of her rent and helping her a little bit with the bill. She makes enough to barely scrape by, but I I don't really want her to do that. So I'm continuing to contribute some towards her monthly expenses, and then I'm paying for both their auto insurance. Uh, and and medical bills at this point as well. What about their cars? Yes. Um, back to my dad. Uh, when they both graduated, his gift to them was cars. What did he get him? Uh, used car. You um uh, uh 2012 Elantra and a 2000 okay. yeah a 12 Civic. But they're running. They're okay. They're gonna. They're, those cars will probably last a few more more okay. years, but. How much are you paying uh, for your second daughter that you mentioned? You know, part of her rent, et cetera. How much is that per month total? Uh, well, it was fourteen hundred a month. Now we've cut it down to seven hundred a month to see how she does. She had about five thousand dollars in a savings account, and she is starting to drain that. So I don't know that the seven hundred just is is sustainable. We haven't talked about increasing it yet, but it's something that I've that I've been thinking about. What about decreasing it? You ever talked about that? We are encouraging her to look for a better job to the point where I we can be eliminated altogether. I think we're kind of hoping that something <laughs> hits and she she eventually gets to the point where she can make enough to be sustained, self-sustained. Uh, but no, I have not specifically said we're going to cut it down even more. I, I think there would be, uh, well, there's already been some back and forth. Um, uh, there is a certain amount that we were, a lot, my, myself and my dad were allotting her to help her get through college. She graduated two years earlier than my other daughter. Um, she got a two year degree versus a four year degree. But then, when we pulled back the money, the response was, well, you planned for four years. I only went two. So where's the rest? <laughs> so how'd you respond to that? Uh, I was, I was taken aback. I said, that's not how this works. You know, the, that money was earmarked to get you through school, not through life. Maybe I should have cut it off altogether. I don't know. Maybe that was a bad parenting decision. I don't know. But that's when I ended up cutting it in half. I think that as people get older, I want them to, as much as possible, eliminate any open-ended expenses they have with no end in sight, Mm -hmm. ones that are not core to them. So if I were in your position, speaking as a total third party who doesn't know the family dynamics or anything, I'll say, look, if you want to help your kids out, great, do it. But just set a time limit. What I'd like to do is I'd like to, for the next three months, we're going to keep things the same. Then we're going to ratchet it down to this. Then we're going to ratchet it down to that. I want you to succeed. I don't want to take away any support immediately, but I also need to look out for my own retirement. Yeah, Rachel and I ironically had just had that discussion a few a few days ago that that might be the best perfect path. So I think you're absolutely right. What do you think? If you had to diagnose what's going on right now, what would you say? I thought Brian's story was really interesting about his dad helping him, even spoiling him, and now I noticed that he's paying for one of his grown daughter's rent. And when he mentions reducing that number, she resists. What we can see here is that the way we treat money is passed down from generation to generation. Let's get back to the show. Brian is trying to protect me by being more confident about the money so that I don't feel anxious. And I think he is 
paying out more money than he really has because he doesn't want me to have to pay more. Got it. All right. Brian, what do you think is going on here? Um, I think that's uh, actually a, a, a pretty fair statement. Uh, I do want to protect her. I know how she feels about money. I know how she worries about it. I don't want to use the word minimize necessarily, but I kind of try to have this demeanor where, you know what, it is going to be okay. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll look at the numbers and go from there. Um, but yeah, I, I love her to death. I don't want her to worry. I hate when she worries. I hate when she's upset. Why do you hate when she worries? I, I just, uh, I, I honestly, I love her that much. I don't, I know how she, she struggled growing up um, with a lot of the monetary issues and the parental issues and whatnot. And I know she is so good at, at saving money and she's on Quicken, you know, more than I'm on, you know, in court um, and that she is just so good with it. And I don't want her to, I don't want to knock her off that path if I don't have to. Um, so I'm probably being well overprotective, uh, but that's kind of my nature. Not saying that's good, I do, but I do think that that is a big part of it. I appreciate that. What do you think about that, Rachel? Oh, I think it's amazing and I love that. But if it is causing him anxiety, if it is causing him to struggle, I would never, ever want them that for him. And I I really want to help him out. I'd like to look at the numbers that you two put together. Um, what was it like doing this conscious spend plan together? <laughs> I I didn't find it that challenging as far as putting it together. The results and the sort of come to Jesus like, whoa, I didn't realize the expenses were that much until we journalized it. Uh, that part was definitely sobering. Definitely. I would say eye-opening, very eye-opening. I did not realize what Brian was paying for expenses on his side. And I'm actually shocked he's been able to kind of juggle the money as he has been able to. And I appreciate that, but I really, if he needs help, want him to be, to help, be able to help him. I want him to tell me and be open with me. All right. Well, let's, let's come up with a way to do that today. That's why we're here. And I, I, again, I just appreciate the two of you did this together. And I can tell that there have been some revelations, which is awesome. Rachel, let's work through these uh, under net worth. The words in bold, just read that out loud and then read the number next to it, please. Okay. Assets are 805,000. Mm -hmm. Investments are, wow, 1,054,173. Um, mm -hmm. Cash value of pension is 480,212. Savings is $78,245. Um, debt is only the mortgage, and it's a balance of $95,745. For a total net worth, which is amazing, is uh, $2,321,885. Uh, <laughs> what do you think of those numbers? I think it's amazing, but I'm going to have a but because a lot of that money isn't making income. So uh, it doesn't mean anything until it's sold or it doesn't mean anything if we keep it. Okay. What do you think about the numbers, Brian? <sighs> this is, I guess, kind of where we, we differ. Um, I, I see the bottom line and it's certainly, you know, hey, pat ourselves on the back. We've done well. I do certainly understand that probably um, between the house, the, the second house, and then we own some land that's thrown into the assets as well. That's, that's probably uh, combined about a million or so. Whoa, um, what? what? What kind of land? Yeah. Like, what's this land? I don't know too many people who just own land. So we we own some vacant land 
that we plan to build, about 40 acres that we plan to build on come retirement. That's a lot. All right, let's take a look at the income, shall we? Let's have Brian do it. Brian, gross combined monthly income. What number do you see? Uh, current monthly combined income, $22,525. All right. That's, uh, that's $270,000 a year. Did you know you made that much in your household income? Ramit, I, I, I mentioned before how generous my dad is. He, he generally will um, give us around Christmas time a, a fairly substantial uh, gift of money. Uh, it's generally 30,000. Okay. He gives you 30,000 at the holidays. Okay. Correct. So I think that was included at, we just sort of delineated that over the monthly income as well. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. But the question, did you know that your household combined income was $270,000 a year? Um, no. Okay. What'd you think it was? (laughs) Did you have any idea at all? I assumed it was probably around 175 or so combined. <laughs> this is actually really funny because on this podcast, you know, 50% of the people I talk to don't know how much their household income is. They literally have no idea. Literally on this call, 50% of the people in this relationship don't know yeah. how much they made and 50% do. Beautiful. I love it. All right. So you thought it was about $100,000 less. Rachel, technically, seeing these numbers, shouldn't that make you feel more comfortable? Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to read it. I probably yes. I mean, the answer is yes. Of course, it should. But no, it doesn't necessarily. Wow. Is it possible that perhaps <laughs> um, the numbers on the page are totally uncorrelated with how you feel about your money? Absolutely. I just love it. Human psychology never gets old to me. Here we have a couple worth $2.3 million still cutting coupons. Grandpa writes a check for $30,000 in a single month. And we have one partner who feels anxious about money. And even when she realizes they actually make $100,000 a year more than she thought, it doesn't change her feelings at all. Everybody say it with me together. The way you feel about money is highly uncorrelated to the amount in your bank account. In fact, everybody pull out your phone right now. Add your five friends or family members to a text and just send them this message. Don't even add any other explanation. Just literally type this right now. The way you feel about money is highly uncorrelated to the amount in your bank account. Don't say anything else. Just hit send. And when you get a bunch of bewildered reactions, screenshot that and DM me on Instagram and send it to me. You know I love this stuff. All right. Your fixed costs, your combined fixed costs are at, what number is this, Rachel? Combined at 71%. All right. So what do you think about that number? Uh, I think it's high. Uh, It's a little high. It should be, you know, ideally 50 to 60. And if you're trying to retire early, maybe even lower, but we could talk about it. So your mortgage is $1,702. What's your interest rate on this mortgage? One, no, no, 2.25, I think. 2.25. What the? Right. Yeah, we, we got lucky. That's pretty good. And then, yeah. um, can I just, uh, I'm just going to read this off with no commentary. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're paying $2,500 extra per month to your mortgage. I have no comments. I just want to point that out and we will come back to that. All right. For everyone listening and watching, you can make your own judgment about whether that's a good idea or not. Gifts are at 500 bucks a month. It's a little unusually high. It's not saying it's wrong. Just asking, are gifts a really important part of your rich life? Uh, For me, it's more around the holidays. I tend to go kind of big and like one of the gifts is usually like a... A, a, a trip of some sort or just something like a, a, a baseball game. We're trying to see all the baseball stadiums because I'm a big baseball fan. And so we'll, we'll maybe go out to California and see the Padres and the Dodgers play and you know, those types of trips. So right. most of those, that gift budget is sort of later in the year. Yeah. All right, fine. Brian, what's this line? Contribution to child living expenses. How much yeah. do you have there? Uh, $1,220 a month. Everybody um, look at Rachel's smile right now. 
<laughs> <laughs> Rachel's like, get him, Ramit. Brian, what's up with this, man? That's a lot of money. That includes the 700 that I have been contributing to the one daughter towards her monthly expenses that, I, that I'm trying to see if I can cut again. But so you try here, you look straight in the camera, tell her what you want to tell her. My editor will cut this into a beautiful thing. We'll put some music. <laughs> we'll put some Hans Zimmer at the end. And a montage. Uh, yeah, it'll be done. It'll be done. All you need to do is just look in the camera and say what you got to say. Yeah. I have a feeling it's not that easy. Yeah, yeah, it's not as easy as I would like. Yes, and phones. Yeah, so I pay for their phones, which is one hundred and sixty dollars, and then the the insurance. Uh, for me, my one of my daughters had an accident the first year she got her license, uh, and her rates are just uh, outlandish. And so I'm um, almost the 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 rest of that balance uh, is insurance rates per month that I'm continuing to pay. Let me ask you a question. First of all, I totally understand you want to help your daughters. And all jokes aside, I get it. I also understand that even if you want to taper off your contributions to your daughter, you would want to do it gradually. You wouldn't want to just go cold turkey. I totally get that. What if, as we go through these numbers, we discover that in order for you to continue contributing $1,220 a month to your daughter's uh, rent, et cetera, you would have to work an extra five, seven, nine years. I'm sorry. I was gulping uh, at the very thought of that. So, um, yeah, I I would obviously prefer not to, but I think I get the point you're making. So, okay. yeah. Cool. Well, we will look at the actual numbers. Okay. But um, I could never come here and tell you or anyone what to do with your money. And I certainly can't come on here and tell a parent, stop what you've been doing for the last 22 years and do it my way. That's not going to work. Mm-hmm. What I can do is show you some different permutations and maybe what some decisions are costing you and just mm-hmm. put it into real terms because ultimately you have to come to your own decision about how you want to do your money and then how the two of you want to come up with your vision for your money. If it were up to me, when I'm talking about a couple in their 50s considering retiring early, I would want this number low. And I want it low for two reasons. One, I want it low because I want you to take the extra money you have now while you're both working and making a very high income to be able to aggressively invest. Because this is the most income you're going to make together as a household. And then secondly, I want low fixed costs because in retirement, you can then sustain yourselves for longer and actually have a, a better life if your fixed costs are low. The good news that I see from looking at your fixed costs is your major expenses are well under control. Do you know the two major expenses that people overspend on in their fixed costs? What do you think, Brian? Uh, uh, Mortgage? Yep. I'm actually laughing at that because Brian is listening to your book on um, CD and he came home several CD. weeks ago. What? Hold on. What? Yeah, I'm. I'm like <laughs> I said. I'm. I'm 56 school. years old. Yeah, Wait. So <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I have to get this for my. No one has ever seen me take this off my. I've never even taken this off. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Okay, I have yeah. the. I have the. I will teach you rich on CD. Hold on. <laughs> I need to dust this. Thing. I've never opened this. Look, I swear to God. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah, I've literally never opened this. Let's just look at this because you're I, the first and maybe only person I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. Wow, this is the first time literally seeing. I will teach you to be rich by Ramit <laughs> oh. Sethi, an oh, yeah. unabridged performance by the <laughs> author. This is unbelievable. I've never met anyone who got the CD thing, so thank you. Yeah, you made my day. Mm-hmm. Beyond meeting the first person who's ever bought my book on CD, <laughs> what's really important is the idea that as you get older. You really need to accept that you're at your peak earning years, which means that you should probably be saving and investing aggressively, especially if you didn't start early in life. I really want you to think of your finances as a wave that you're surfing. When you're young, you have a lot of time, but not much money. So what's important is to set up the habits of automatic investing. The habits are much more important than contributing $10,000 a month. 
as the wave of life goes on, you might have kids or you might buy a house, which means that for a while, you may not be able to contribute as much to your investments. And that's okay to intentionally dial down your savings or investments. But then you get back on track, always increasing your percentages as your household income increases. In fact, one of the most profitable decisions you'll ever make is to simply increase your savings contribution and your investment contribution by 1% every year. You do that, it's worth tens of thousands, often hundreds of thousands of dollars to you. Now, as you get into your peak earning years, you really focus on contributing as much as possible so you can surf out of that wave into a calm retirement for the next 20 to 40 years. Also, if you want to get my book, you can get the CD version or you can also get it on Audible. I will add a link below. All right, so what's up with these investments? This $1,054,000 in investments. What type of investments are these? Uh, mine is is the 401k mm -hmm. um, that is, uh, I don't know, the latest value is like 460000 Okay. Then, then I have a pension um, as well. 460. What's the other 600 or so, $550,000 here? Rachel? 593,900 and something. 90, uh, yeah, is um, a combination of my deferred compensation and my Roth IRA. All right, very nice. All right, cool. So these are solid investments. That's good. They're they're making money. They're compounding. Love to see it. And Brian, you used to be contributing double. I used to contribute twenty percent until we made the decision to to blitzkrieg the mortgage the way we did. How did you decide that? Well, <laughs> when I say we decided, uh, I might be giving myself too much credit. Um, uh, we it's it is, okay. We, he knows. <laughs> um. She she had mentioned it to me uh, and why it might be a good idea, um, especially I think in light of my retiring to get get rid of that uh, big an expense. Um, so it certainly made sense to me. But in all honesty, as I was reading the book, listening to the podcast, <laughs> I started thinking, wow, maybe maybe that money is better invested, uh, especially since our mortgage percentage rate. Uh, is is so low, and so that that was certainly one of the the things we wanted to yeah um, open the door on. Did you ever bring that up with her? Uh, yeah, actually, we've we've talked about that a lot. Um, yeah, Rachel, have, what's your take? Yeah. I haven't been very open to that. No. <laughs> um, did you Did you hear your mom and dad's voice in your ear saying, "Pay off the debt"? The only true American is one with a paid off mortgage. That kind of thing. Yes, and um, I do feel like housing is one of the bigger expenses that we have. And when his income leaves and he retires, it's only his pension that he's going to be able to access for a couple of years. And so it's my income and then his pension, which is yeah. significantly less than what he's making. All right. I spend a lot of my, I guess, guilt-free uh, spending on uh, my hobby. Um, uh, which I've, I've been doing since I was a little boy, um, which is you know, card collecting. Um, now I've reached that point in my life where I think it's time to start selling stuff instead of collecting it as much. Oh. And so that's kind of another thing that we've been talking about as far as supplemental income and what, how much would that make you to ballpark depending on the, um, uh, how often um, I wouldn't sell it all at once. I just don't think that would be plausible. But over the course of maybe five to ten years, uh, probably another ten to fifteen thousand a year. A know? year? Yeah, it's worth one hundred and fifty thousand. Probably. I've been collecting since since I was like thirteen. What are these and baseball I'm, cards? Yeah, primarily. Damn. Primarily. That's um, cool. I thought you were going to say 10 or 15. I was like, all right, let's get back to this. 15K uh, a year times 10. That's a lot of money, man. Yeah. Wow. And, and it's just sitting right now instead of being active. So you're um, right. You're right. Yeah. It's not, I mean, yeah. maybe it's accumulating value, but if it's me, 
And I am, I think you're 56 years old, right? Correct. And yes. I'm 56 years old and I, I'm sitting on 150K. I'm like, damn, let me put that to work. Yeah. Let me, let me take yeah. 85% of that and invest it because I know that's going to compound. And let me take the rest of it and go have a nice vacation. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't have the emotional connection that you do, I understand. And mm -hmm. so, you, like you said, you may want to drip it out, but it's awesome to know that you're sitting on this asset that you could capitalize on. Right. Well right. done. All right, cool. All right, so overall, going through those numbers, how do you feel about it? Rachel, what do you think? Uh, I... I feel like the numbers must not reflect something because I think Brian is secretly more anxious about things than he's willing to admit. So I, I don't know what's going on. I honestly don't. Well, uh, I mean, we know why Brian's anxious. I'll show you. Well, first of all, you, you two have your money separate. Okay, that, that's yeah. important to know. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong, although I think you probably shouldn't combine it after eight years. But um, I just want to point out why Brian is anxious. It's very easy to see. The answer is? Yes. See this number? Yes. Re uh, what I'm pointing out for everyone listening is uh, they've split their, in their expenses and incomes. So I can see all their fixed costs broken out by each partner. And Brian's fixed costs is 79%. 79. And Rachel's is 54. And when combined, it's 69. So Brian, when you hear your fixed costs are 79%, what does that tell you? Uh, it, was a, it was literally a smack in the face when we were doing the CSP uh, to see that number. So yeah, it was a, a mind-blowing experience. You know? That's why you're stressed out. So the good news, as I said, is that I think there are some things we can change. And what I'd like to do, because you're both very smart, is I'd like to ask you to take a crack at this. So where would you like to start to reduce these numbers? We are now looking at their fixed costs. Oh, I hate the idea of it, but I think you probably have to take out extra to the mortgage. <laughs> yeah. um, and then... Hold on, hold on, uh, hold on, hold on. That's, that's a big move. Let's just talk about that. Oh, All right, so yes. you want to what? Just simply stop putting that money. Is that what I'm hearing? I don't want to do. I I would prefer to find some other outlet um, that would reduce this fixed cost. Other than that, honestly, right. Let's talk about this. The interest rate being two point two five percent. If we're looking at it purely from a math perspective, which is not how anyone looks at money, but I'm just going to give you the math. I look at this and I go, hey. I'm comfortable having a little bit of debt like a mortgage because I know that instead of paying uh, my mortgage early, I would take the $2,500 a month and I would invest it knowing that I could get about 7%. But some people, I'm assuming this might be true of you, Rachel, just hate debt. They just hate it. They hate a mortgage. They hate it. And they go, I don't care about all this math. I just want to get rid of this mortgage. Which one is it for you? I hate it. I just want to get rid of it. And the fact that I almost lost my house because I couldn't afford to pay a mortgage really scares me. I, I, I know it. that it shouldn't. I know that that is something that happened in a different situation with a different person. And that is not where we are right now. But the fear of not being able to afford a mortgage um, just terrifies me, which is actually really ridiculous because we have a second home that's completely paid off. <laughs> you could do it any way you like, but each one has its costs. So right now, the cost that you are incurring is that Brian is really stressed out about money. You're actually losing a lot of money that you could make investing $2,500 a month, which is a lot of money. Okay? Yes. So that's the cost. But you feel safer. It makes yeah. sense sometimes. But on the other hand, we can't have it all because Brian, like, you know, Brian is a giver. Brian has said he gives to his kids, he gives to you, he's very generous. And, yeah. and finally, looking at these numbers, he's shocked, you're shocked, everybody's shocked. 
well, the math just doesn't add up if we want to do it all. Yeah. So let's play it out, all right? Let's, let's just play okay. this. Let's say right now you're currently paying $2,500 a month to your mortgage. Extra. I want to zero that out for a second, okay? Wow. Say it, Brian. Tell us what just happened. Wow. Fixed costs just went down 13% from 79 to 66. Rachel's fixed costs just went down from 54% to 36%. So that's an 18% yeah. decrease. And then can I show you something else that's kind of magical? So let's say here that we do... I'm going down to investments now. And I'm just putting it in a taxable account. 2500 a month. Okay? And I'm going to take all that money that you two were repaying your 2.25% mortgage. I think it's actually a two and a half. But I understand. All right. right. And I'm just going to plug it in to show you how much additional you could make just by investing it. Again, simple investments. So let's just say zero. That's your current principle. We're just keep it simple. Uh, it's going to be $30,000 a year. How many years should we assume that this happens? 10 to 15. All right, let's say 15, just to see. Okay. And what interest rate should we assume? I think seven or eight is, is Yeah, let's say normal. seven, just to be okay. conservative. All right, so this is the money that you're currently prepaying. Rachel, what's that big smile on your face before I even click calculate? <laughs> I don't even want to see what it is. <laughs> I, uh, I don't want to know. There's no secret <laughs> A fund here. There's no bull <laughs> survivorship. There's nothing. Just pure math. Look at that number. $806,000. Oh. Wow. Oh. oh, my gosh. Look at the face. Both of them. Damn it. <laughs> 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 but a good damn it. Um, wow. Yeah. Rachel, talk to me. Oh. I, l I love your reaction. <laughs> Tell me what's going through your mind right now. Oh, it's great, but I wanted it to be really low because I want to <laughs> keep putting extra the mortgage and not have a mortgage in like two years. Well, look, the good news is you can. If you want to, you can. Okay. Yeah, this but Brian can't afford it. I mean, realistically, okay. he is really anxious and I get it. And I'm here and I'm with you in order to try to help. And so it's not fair for me to say, like, I'm not going to make that sacrifice in order to help him. I think we could afford it. I think with the tweaking of the fixed costs, I am definitely now looking at what Ramith just did <laughs> and saying as much as I want to take that burden off and, and I agree with you, it would be a great form of relaxation. Wow. What we would potentially be giving up to do that is, um, wow. It's just kind of sobering. I'm hearing both of you acknowledge that, oh my gosh, maybe the way I was thinking about it was not right. Gosh, I see the math, but I still feel this way. What about you? I'm seeing this in front of my eyes, and it is a beautiful thing. So you're on the right track. Maybe Brian goes, hey, instead of uh, selling my baseball cards over 10 years, I'm going to sell them over three years because then I could fund even more. In fact, let me show you what that looks like. Hey, Brian, how much if you sell it? Well, it's the same amount. Let's say you sell it over three years. You're going to make what? 150 k should we say 100K just to be conservative? Yeah, let's do 100 just to be right. con conservative. So let's say we start off with $100,000. Let's just pretend you sold them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you add $30,000 more. So essentially, we just added your baseball cards in here. Okay. okay. Instead of it at the end of 15 years being 800000 that turns into $1.08 1 million. So the money starts to get larger. And then what happens is if you extend it just like to 20 years, 1.7 million. Mm -hmm. It starts to really, really grow. At a certain point, you can't stop it. We're talking about a lot of money here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not saying sell your baseball cards tomorrow. I'm just saying you have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. That is, that's comforting. Yeah. All right, all right. Let's keep, let's keep going. 
That comes down to here. I'm taking their gifts from fixed costs and moving them down to savings, the gift category. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're now saving for that every single month. And then at the end of the year, you know exactly how much you can afford for a baseball game, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right, that now takes, oh my God, that takes uh, Brian down to 56%, which is, you will not be stressed about your day-to-day money at 56%. You're going to feel good. Mm-hmm. Rachel, you're at 33, which is starting to concern me. Like, why aren't you spending a little bit more on something? <laughs> um, but we, we'll work, worry about that. That's another problem we can work on. Because you took the extra out of the mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Do you want to pay towards the mortgage? Oh, I do. I would love to. While Brian does not. Do you want to do that? I don't have a problem with that at all. I would love to. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you seem pretty positive. <laughs> this is a big decision. Go ahead if you want to discuss it. I don't think there's really discussion. Why are you concerned about it? Well, well just the fairness of it. I don't, I mean, we agreed we we're going to try to pay it off together, and it's both of our debt together. And I don't want you to potentially get to the point where you're hurting a month or two and in a row and say, well, gosh, darn it. I wish Brian was, you know, doing his, his part. And I don't know. I just, I I don't, I don't want to derail you from, from what I know is, is very important to you. I think that that's really, really sweet, but it, I think would help me honestly in sort of my rich life. I mean, that is just my personality and I want to get it paid off as quickly as possible. I don't want to lose momentum. I don't feel strapped at all. I mean, I don't have any problems, you know, paying that money. It's not the money that I live off of. And I don't want you to struggle in order to help contribute. I honestly want you to feel as relaxed about money as I feel right now, where I don't have any issues paying for anything. I mean, I'm truly just, we're living our best lives in my view. And I want you to have that. But right now I don't see it. I don't feel it. I feel fine. I'm o- I- I'm okay with it. I I it's I I hurt for her. I just I I know she's being brave and I I want to feel like I'm contributing, but maybe that's more my issue than than anything. It seems clear to me, Brian, that you are contributing. It seems clear from absolutely. The Would we all agree? Absolutely. All right. Yes, and that's what I was going to say. I in no way feel that he's not contributing. He is so generous. He contributes so much and more than just monetarily. I mean, he is just amazing and I love him to death. Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's a gut check moment for me to get over that. I think that, that pride and tradition and all that certainly play a a large part in, in that. I'm grateful. I think that's fantastic. I think that frees up money. I love you very much. Why don't we see how it goes for the year? And if we're we like the track we're on, we'll we'll keep doing that. I'm fine with that. Huh. Um, taking this away from him doesn't affect the way that I feel about him in any way. As a matter of fact, in some ways, it like makes me love him more. Now, there's one thing I really want you to take away from today's conversation, and that is that there's usually a lot of different paths to a rich life. If you really want to pay your mortgage off early. Fine. If you want to help your daughter with her rent, okay. But in order to find the best path, you have to acknowledge how you feel about money. You have to run the numbers. And you've got to have a series of healthy, joint conversations about money. Now, Brian and Rachel did all of those things, and I'm very proud of them. Now, let's listen to their follow ups. First, Brian. The thing I learned the most. Uh, was how effective communication can be. Sometimes these issues are hard to talk about, even when you're very honest and open like uh, Rachel and I are. But we have found that talking about money is not nearly as hard as we thought it was. So we've been doing that a lot more lately. Biggest surprise was how easy it is to tweak certain things. Um, If you really dig deep and kind of see 
where you're spending too much money, um, it's not that hard to, to change that. And our plan going forward, we're going to compromise. I think we're going to continue to pay off the house with an extra payment, but we're going to cut it in half. Uh, we're going to use the other half of that extra mortgage payment we've been making uh, and invest that. So that's kind of our plan for the house going forward. Uh, and we're still working on stuff then uh, to figure out how to cut our expenses and, and increase our investment. So uh, I think it's a good plan going forward and we'll see how it goes. And now, Rachel. I learned that I am going to have to definitely let go to those lessons from the past and those experiences from the past that no longer serve me. I was very surprised to find out how much I am holding on to almost losing my house. And um, from talking to you, I realized that that experience had a lot more to do with the relationship that I was in at the time versus the financial position we were in. Going forward, Brian and I are going to uh, look more closely at his fixed costs and hopefully move forward together in order to help him retire early. Um, we are taking away the extras of the mortgage from him so that he can actually um, put more money into retirement. But it's a really great experience. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you so much to you and your team. Take care. Bye-bye.